Hey everyone, uh, Mr. Foster here. It's going on about 7.40 on Monday night. And I am um, drinking coffee because that is just the kind of day it's been today. So um, hang in there with me. Uh, as I mentioned, I wanted to take some time uh, this evening to talk about the uh, the poem that I had you all writing on. Now, um, even though, you know, we, we're beginning our second unit, uh, we actually have kind of gone back to the introduction of the textbook on page 13 for this poem. So um, the reason I want to talk about this poem is because uh, I think it does a good job of kind of giving us some of the things that we need to practice with as we are getting um, getting into poetry. Now, I know at the beginning of the class, we uh, we did do a little bit of poetry as far as, um, like, practice analysis, right? But um, we didn't really do anything um, like this poem, I would say. So the most common thing that I would hear students, you know, kind of complain about, if you want to say that, when it comes to poetry is... Um, you know, like, oh, it doesn't make any sense. Like, what are they even talking about? I can't tell what's going on. All that kind of stuff, right? So, yeah, poetry can sometimes be confusing, right? It can be a little bit confusing sometimes. But uh, if you kind of just work through it, and especially if you use the, uh, like, the footnotes. I'm trying to pull this book up at the same time. Um, the footnotes that are at the uh, bottom of the page in your textbook. Um, you can work through them, right? You can work through these kinds of poems. So let's uh, read this poem. I'll read it for us. Um, but before before we do that, just a couple of things I want to take note of. So uh, just quick terminology. You know, when we're talking about poetry, uh, the groups of lines are called stanzas. So you have one, two, three, four, five stanzas here, right? So uh, you would say something like, if you were writing about the poem, you would, you would say something like, in uh, stanza number three, line number ten, that's kind of what you would say if you were writing about the poem and wanted to pick out a line. Um, another quick distinction you need to make is that the poet and the speaker are not the same thing, right? So our poet in this case is John Crow Ransom. But our speaker is the person that is telling us the information in the poem, okay? So um, make that distinction between poet and speaker, right? Um, but I think really that's all we, we really need to know before we start talking about this. Uh, there are dozens and dozens of terms you can use when you're talking about poetry. I am not a poet. Uh, I am a fiction writer. I'm not a poet. I can... I can you know, if you put a gun to my head and told me to write a poem, I can do it, um, and I can talk about poetry, but um, I am, I'm a fiction writer, not a poet, so uh, kind of bear with me as, as we talk about poetry. I can still make sure you understand the main things we need to understand throughout the poem, okay? So let's read this one. This is uh, Bells for John Whiteside's Daughter by John Crow Ransom, okay? So it starts like this. There was such speed in her little body, and such lightness in her footfall. It is no wonder her brown study astonishes us all. Her wars were brooded in our high window. We looked among the orchard trees and beyond where she took arms against her shadow or carried onto the pond. The lazy geese, like a snow cloud, gripping their snow on the green grass, tricking and stopping, sleepy and proud, who cried in goose, alas, there the tire, or sorry, for the tireless heart within the little lady with rod that made them rise from their noon apple dreams and scuttle goose fashion under the skies. But now go the bells, and we are ready. In one house we are sternly stopped to say we were vexed at her brown study laying so primly prop. Sorry, that's lying there in the last line. Lying so primly prompt. Okay? So 
let's talk about some things that we can do when we look at this poem, okay? So you can look at poems in many different ways. You can talk about things like the movements of the words in the line. You can talk about the use of punctuation. You can talk about the word choice. Sorry, my cat is deciding to get behind my monitor. Turbo, come on. Everyone say hi to Turbo. All right, back to the poetry. So, um, like I said, you can look at the way the words move within the line. You can look at the way uh, that the poet chooses the words that are used, right? Um, for example, in stanza two, line five, where it says her wars were brooded, right? If you don't know what that word means, either, you know, just Google it or look down here and it will tell you, right? The book will tell you, okay? But it's like, why did he choose to use that word there? And then, of course, you get into things like the metaphors and the similes, so on and so on, the figurative use of language, things of that nature. But regardless of how you're going to approach it, I always say try to start out with, and I think we've talked about this before, start out with the concrete and then move to the abstract, right? So for a poem like this, you would ask yourself, okay, what are some of the pieces of information that are here that are concrete, right? What can we say with 100% certainty is happening inside of this poem? So let's look at some of the stuff, right? So starting with co concrete information, uh, begin with the title, right? Uh, we apparently have Bells, and we have this man's daughter, right? So we know that Bells are involved in somehow, and we have a man, and the poem is about the man's daughter. Concrete information. We can figure that much out, right? Uh, so let's see what else. There was such speed in her little body, and such lightness in her footfall. So pretty straightforward still, right? Uh, it's talking about, you know, the little girl being quick and nimble, right? Uh, she moved with speed, and uh, she stepped lightly, right? If you've ever watched a child run around and play, you know that's how they move, right? That's what's being described here. Such speed in her little body and such lightness in her footfall. It is no wonder her brown study astonishes us all, okay? So again, let's look at a couple things here. So look at the way that stanza is shaped, right? So each line progressively gets shorter, right? So little body goes out to here, right? Such lightness in her footfall. It is no wonder her brown study astonishes us all. Okay, let's look at a few things. So the first two lines do not end in periods, they end with commas, right? So there is such speed in her little body, comma, and such lightness in her footfall, comma, and it is no wonder her brown study astonishes us all, period, right? So you can talk about things like what is the effect of each line becoming shorter? And then uh, the final line of the stanza, which is the shortest, astonishes us all having a period after, after it, right? Comma, comma, and then there's nothing after study. It just continues down to astonishes us all, period, right? Uh, what is the effect of using the punctuation like that? What does that do to the stanza? What is that? What kind of effect does that create? So also think about the word use here, right? The word astonish. That's a pretty big word to use right there, right? Especially using it in the shortest line of the poem, ending that line with the first period that, that goes up in the poem, right? Astonishes us all, period, okay? So from there, you have to look at things like, okay, what is it talking about when it says her brown study, right? So again, think about starting with concrete and going to abstract, right? So I say we can pretty concretely figure out what um, is being described in the first two lines. It's her kind of playful, childlike movement. But then does the stanza take a turn after those two lines? Does it start to sound darker and more serious? Now look, we've got um, five stanzas total in the poem. Each stanza is composed of two lines, right? So maybe you can look at it as what are the first two lines in each stanza doing compared to what are the, the second half of the stanza, the last two lines in each stanza doing, right? 
And again, take note of how the poem is shaped. Okay? So what does this mean when it says, it is no wonder her brown study? What does that mean? Study. Look, down at the bottom of the page. Study with the little seven. Footnote, seven. Study. State of intense contemplation or reverie. Okay? So contemplation kind of just means like deep thinking. And reverie means like kind of like a daydream or some kind of like dreamlike sequence that you're that you're stuck in. Okay. So it's talking about her brown um daydream or her brown, you know, state of mind, something like that. Astonishes us all. Okay. But let's really talk about what's happening here. Okay. So again, compare the first two lines to the, the second two lines in the poem, right? Four lines, two, two. Look at what kind of contrast is being created here, right? Uh, the movement and the lightness and the freedom of the first two lines, such speed in the little body, such lightness in her football. And then see how kind of serious and more, um, more kind of dreadful sounding the next two lines are. It is no wonder her brown study astonishes us all. Are they talking about this child being in a casket? Maybe. Her wars were brooded. Again, if you don't know what that word means, look at the bottom of the page. Brooded means heard, but also suggesting noise or clamor. Okay? So it's saying her wars were heard, the noise was heard, in our high window here. We looked among the orchard trees and beyond where she took arms against her shadow or harried onto the pond. Now notice there's no period after pond. The lazy geese like a snow cloud dripping their snow on the green grass, pricking and stopping, sleepy and proud, who cried in goose, alas, for the tireless heart within the little lady with the rod that made them rise from their noon apple dreams and scuttle whose fashion under the skies. What What is this talking about? Okay, so let's look. Again, notice the punctuation. So starting in the second stanza, the first line, we only have uh, one period here, right? Her wars were, uh, I'm just going to use the word heard, because now we know what this means, right? Brooded means heard. Um, her wars were heard in our high window, period. And then we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. We have about 12 lines until we get any more ending punctuation, okay? With the uh, exclamation point at the end of the fourth stanza with the uh, exclamation point after the word skies, okay? So we have, um, we have like three stanzas essentially with, with no ending punctuation, okay? So what is that doing? What is that creating a sense of in the poem? Let's talk about it. So let's break this down into more literal language, right? So we have figurative language here and we have imagery. We have all of this poetic stuff happening. Well, let's talk about it in terms of literal language, okay? So what they're saying is that the little girl was heard playing outside, right? That's all it's talking about here. It's just saying that she was heard playing outside, uh, maybe up in like a second or third floor window, right? It says in our high window. So imagine that uh, maybe these people are living in like a tall apartment building, but they have their window open. They can hear this little girl playing outside, right? They can hear her playing outside from their high window, okay? So let's keep going. So it says that they uh, looked and saw among the trees, the orchard trees and beyond, they look outside their window because they hear her playing, so they look outside, okay? It says she took arms against her shadow, and it says that this could be an allusion to Hamlet, uh, the Shakespeare play Hamlet. It says that there in footnote number nine. Uh, so she took arms against her shadow out among the trees, or she also would harry onto the pond, which means like run out onto the pond, right? 
And what hangs out around ponds? Geese, right? So let's look at this, these two um, stanzas here, kind of in the middle of the poem, that are talking about the geese. We get a lot of words, a lot of language, a lot of imagery, a lot of figurative language. But all these two stanzas are saying, between lines 9 and 16, is that this little girl ran out to the pond and she made the geese scared away, right? She scared away the geese and they fly, right? So if you've ever seen a child, uh, I see it more commonly with ducks, right? But say there are a bunch of ducks just chilling on the water and a little kid says, oh, I'm going to go mess with these ducks and they charge and they run at the ducks. What do the ducks do? They all start flying away, right? All of these words in these two stanzas, all of this language is just saying that the little girl would run out and make the geese on the pond fly away, right? So let's read it again, now that we know that. Uh, starting with line duh, 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 nine, I believe here, where it says, or harried onto the pond, the lazy geese, like a snow cloud. Um, so remember, in poetry, or I guess in any writing, whatever, when you have that comparison using like or as, we call that a simile, right? So we get a simile here. The lazy geese, comma, like a snow cloud, Comparison using like or as. Dripping their snow on the green grass. This is just imagery, right? It's just talking about these white geese. That's all it is. We're just talking about these geese, okay? Tricking, stoppy, sleepy, and proud. Who cried in goose. Now, this is probably the most confusing phrase in the line. Uh, what do geese speak? They speak goose, right? Uh, it's just saying that the, the sounds that the geese make, right? Uh, whatever sound a goose makes, I, I'm not going to try to replicate it. Uh, but it says that they the geese cried out because they got startled, right? The little girl ran up on them and scared them. So they cried in goose. That's the language of the geese. Okay, cried in goose. A laugh for the trickless heart within the little lady with the rod. Or sorry, the tireless heart. Yeah, tireless heart within the little lady with the rod. That made them rise. So maybe she had like a fishing rod or something as she's running out to the pond. But she made the geese rise. She made them get up and fly away, right? From their noon apple dreams. Apparently that's what geese dream about at noon. They have apple dreams at noon, right? And scuttle goose fashion under the skies. It's just saying that the goose scuttled and flew away, right? Scuttled in goose fashion, okay? But now I want you to think about all of this imagery, all of this movement that is going on here in the poem, and look at what the final stanza does, okay? But now go the bells, and we are ready. In one house, we are sternly stopped. That's called alliteration. In a line of poetry, when you have two or more words that begin with the same letter, that's alliteration. So sternly stopped is alliteration. To say we are vexed, and we get, again, a, uh, we call this repetition, right? The same uh, phrase is repeated here from the da -da -da first stanza, where it says brown study. So this time it says um, vexed, right? The first time it says her brown study astonishes us all. And then in this stanza, the final stanza, it says that they are vexed at her brown study. So you might want to do that whenever a phrase is uh, repeated twice, whenever you have a repetitious phrase, you might want to go back and look at the way it's used, right? The first time it says Brown study astonishes them all in the first stanza, and the final stanza it says we're vexed at her Brown study. Now look at how the poem ends. Lying so primly propped. We get more alliteration there with P and P, primly propped. Is this poem about a little girl who is dead and lying in a coffin? And if so, what do the first and last stanzas do in comparison to the stanzas in the middle, the second, third, and fourth stanzas? Again, I want you to think about the contrast of the movement, right? How does this poem contrast the child's activities and her movement with her situation? of presumably being dead and lying in a coffin, right? So I, uh, just some things to think about, right? But um, 
Again, I think the thing that trips up students the most, right, is talking about a brown study. What does that mean, right? Uh, what is going on with these geese, right? What is what is what is uh, what does it mean to cry and goose, right? Stuff like that um, can trip students up with this poem. Uh, but really, in my personal opinion, I think this poem is what we would call something like an elegy, right? Which is a poem for someone who has passed away, okay? And it's kind of talking about remembering the way that this little girl was when she was alive, right? Remembering how she behaved and how playful and childlike and carefree she was when she was alive. Specifically using the memory of running out to the pond with what we can assume is a fishing rod and then scaring away all the geese, right? Uh, specifically using that memory to talk about um, the, the contrast uh, between her life and death, right? Um, again... I say this all the time, especially when we're talking about poetry. I mean, to an extent when we talk about fiction, but especially when we talk about poetry. And something that drives students crazy about this kind of stuff is unless we actually talk to the person who wrote it, unless we talk to John Crow Ransom or whoever it is that's writing these poems, we don't know for sure, right? We don't have any way of knowing for sure. So what we have to do is we just have to analyze it and figure it out the best we can with the, with the information that we have, right? So um, I always tell students that when you're doing analysis like this, there's not really any right or wrong answer as long as you can support what you're saying, right? Can you support your argument using evidence from the piece of text you're writing about, right? So if I was going to write a literary analysis essay on this poem, I would probably say something like, this poem is an elegy for a little girl, and it uses the memory of her running out onto a pond and scattering away a bunch of geese as this kind of uh, metaphor for remembrance of kind of the, the carefree and innocence of childhood and how that um, contrast with this kind of like stark and grim reality of death, right? I would probably say something like that, okay? So uh, before this video gets too long, I'm going to go ahead and stop it there. Um, so again, I want you to finish this up. Make sure you are giving your response on the bells for John Whiteside's daughter. If you made it all the way through this video, and if you want to use my interpretation, go for it. I, I won't uh, knock off any points or anything for you doing that. But um, again, I want us to, to do this poem because I want us to um, be able to, to read a poem and not let it dump us, right? Not let, us, not let it confuse us. Uh, even if it is confusing, we can still work through it, right? We can still take it piece by piece, uh, find different ways of analyzing it, and work our way through it to get some kind of analysis, right? Whether it is... Um, analyzing the way that the poet uses certain words, analyzing the way the poet uses punctuation or doesn't use punctuation, um, looking at the shape of the poem or the way that the words and lines move within the poem. Those are all different things you can do, right? So uh, I'll go ahead and stop it there for this update. Please let me know if you have any questions and good luck with your poetry.